everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Feel the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a dog for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Our mystery drama, A Second Chance, was written especially for Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Paul Hecht and Bob Caliban. Ah, there we are. <laughs> On Everything Old is New Again, we're going to celebrate Radio and Mystery Theater. Sands, our uh, friend David Cohen, unfortunately, he's under the weather. But today I have got two special guests that will help us bring back uh, the memories of Radio Mystery Theater. The show, by the way, that was on from January 1974 to December 31st, 1982. It was a radio drama series that was created by Hyman Brown, hosted by E.G. Marshall, and broadcast each weeknight. Uh, you've heard me talk about this show as uh, something that had an influence upon me to creating everything old is new again and and uh and it's just that along with bob and ray and gene shepherd kind of formed my foundation of my love of radio and and uh 1399 episodes total for radio mystery theater it uh, puts me to sleep at night and in a good way i listen to it before i go to sleep every so often i've got my kids <laughs> listening uh every so often they're a little young but some episodes are, are worth their while it's it's interesting it has a bit of maybe you could say a little twilight zone in it maybe a little bit of love there's certainly mystery there's adventure there's even some ufo and supernatural so if you get a chance take a listen to radio mystery theater cbs radio mystery theater you can find it on the internet at this point but we're celebrating that as we do on everything old is new again i want to talk to two tremendous individuals that were a, a cornerstone if you will of everything old of, i should say of cbs radio mystery theater maybe one day they'll be a cornerstone of everything old is new again <laughs> <laughs> paul heck graduated from the national theater school of canada in 63, made his Broadway debut in 68 in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, for which he was nominated for Tony Award, and he continued on Broadway in some popular shows like the 1776, Caesar and Cleopatra, Henry IV, both uh, along with the last two with uh, Rex Harrison and many more. He's appeared in television on Kate and Alley, Law and Order, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, as well as, as the world term, Starsky and Hutch, Remington Steele. Miami Vice and more. He's appeared with Howard Stern. We may talk a little bit about radio and the influence of Howard Stern a little bit with as as Ross Buckingham, if you remember seeing Private Parts. He was <laughs> uh, on uh, Down to Earth with Chris Rock. Alan Ald is a new life. We just had uh, Hal, uh, Lyndon on the show, and we've had Alan Ald in the past, so now we're coming full circle. We're going to get the the whole cast of that movie <laughs> sooner or later on Everything Old is New Again. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, he was in Last Call with Jeremy Irons, C Sissy Spacek. He served as president of the New York branch of the Screen Actors Guild from 91 in 95 and reads the school children uh, as part of the uh, Green Actors uh, Book Pals program from 74 to 82. He lent his talents and appeared in 138 episodes of Radio Mystery Theater. Welcome, Paul. Thank Heck. you. Thank you, my you life. never stop. My life flashing. My past <laughs> life flashing before me. It's right. terrifying. <laughs> now that we only have three minutes left for this section, I'll introduce uh, right. our next guest. <laughs> You'll need every every minute of it. It's about time. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's see. we got Bob Cowell. Caliban, who yes. is a native of Iowa. We're certainly uh, happy to hear that. We've got a couple of stations, including KXEL in Iowa, that uh, that um, services the, the same area that Mr. Caliban was born, but born, it, born, born in. One of them. Hello. Uh, <laughs> yes. I <laughs> uh, began acting uh, in Car 54, Where Are You? with Fred Gwynn. It's uh, interesting. We may talk yeah, about that a little bit. Fred, I love How about that? Him. Uh, in 62, he appeared on many TV shows, including uh, Patty Duke, uh, Bernstein Bears, uh, Law and Order, um, Schoolhouse Rock, I think you know him from, uh, also Top Cat the Movie from 2011. From 74 to 82, he appeared in 97 episodes of Radio Mystery Theater. Again, welcome, 
Bob Caliban. Oh, it's and don't forget, pleasure. Bobby was also a president of uh, Screen Actors Guild. Yes, I, yes, you notice how he just, just kind of yeah, yeah, flashes yeah, yeah. right across those. <laughs> <things>. <laughs> but I, I did a lot of Broadway too, so that was good. Excellent. What what Broadway comes to mind? Well, the then? biggest one is How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. So there you go. I That's was uh, Finch a few nights when Bobby Morris was out. So very <laughs> nice. nice. So we've got some Broadway talent here on oh, Everything yes. Old is New Again. We can talk about that a little bit. But let's dive into a little bit about uh, Everything Old is New Again's fascination with uh, all things radio and mystery theater. The question is, maybe one of you can just give me a, a, a little idea of what you feel radio and mystery, mystery theater was back in the day. For me... It was uh, an opportunity to be so many different people because Hyman Brown, I don't know what it is about that man, uh, <laughs> he uh, had to have everything his way, but the way it was uh, established, you came up with the characters and Hyman just uh, adored most of the stuff that I did. And uh, every time that I would get a call to do... Uh, mystery theater i knew i had to book out uh almost the rest of the day because that's what it was and i was very busy at the time doing a lot of commercials and i think oh gee no i can't give him a whole day for 127 uh, yeah for 127 dollars or something but it was probably the most um yeah. beautiful opportunity yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. characterize so many different uh, parts and uh, work with the most incredible people. Uh, uh, Paul Hecht, one of them, and it was just marvelous because uh, Hyman saw something in me and he had me come in over and over again, and I just uh, I enjoyed that so much. And that's, that's great to hear because we enjoyed it on the other side of the radio. Uh, well, that's it, good. It kind I of hope. translated. You, there are times you go to plays, uh, whether it's on Broadway or community theater, anywhere in between, and the play takes you to another place. Sometimes it doesn't because it's not done well. Oh yes. But I very rarely find that on everything old um, on CBS Radio Mystery Theater. I very rarely find that it does not take me to another place. It really achieves its objective. I think. Very well, Paul. There is something about that very intimate connection with the human voice and the ear. It's, I mean, when I when I talk to the kiddies about audio books, which I've done a lot of, and stuff like that, I think I said, just think that you're only three inches away from their their soul. You know, their it goes right like there's like a, a, a an audio laser beam that goes right into you. And um, that's 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 one of the things that's magical about radio, about audio books, and uh, that, that that is what it's like. I, I, I mean, I mean the what Bobby said about about High's ability to cast is 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 quite true. I don't quite know how he did it. I don't either. Um, uh, there are a few other people that I knew, not many. Uh, the other person who was brilliant at it was Isaiah Sheffer, who ran uh, Symphony Space uh, Selected Shorts. He would know exactly who to, who to get. And so all he would do, I mean, I basically, with the exception of some of his eccentricities, would essentially <laughs> stay out of your way. I mean, I did not like accents. Yeah, he no, did didn't. not like it if you got too close to the mic. Nope, <laughs> you're right. And he did not like it if you didn't know how to cut quickly, because he had a special. I think this is a half baked theory. It may not be true. He had a special contract with AFTRA, with our with our union, which allowed him to work for a finite period of time, which allowed him only to have a run th a read through of yep. the script. A short break to pee and have a coffee, <laughs> and then and and then and cut, then, then cut, and then do it. Yep. And and it was, it was completely limited. And if you didn't know how to cut quickly, he would say, "Okay, page forty-two, uh, line five. Sing after cut from uh, uh, never mind to uh, simoleons. Yep. You know, and you'd have to just." cut like crazy and he would go mad when some people would go oh, hi i'm hi brian oh. or brian or Robert. Oh. <laughs> i um, i didn't and then he would just go nuts yeah right? he would he would go crazy, go crazy <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, don't climb in on me no no don't 
Don't get too close to the mic. Don't climb in on me. Remember all of that stuff? <laughs> oh, and do I ever. Accents. He just did not like. No, and. Uh, he did not like accents. And and you were clearly split into a leading man. Oh, very much. Was, or a character man. Yeah. Bobby was. And that's all and, I was. You, you would never. Did you ever do a leading. I don't think I role? did. No. I was constantly angling to play a character role. Yeah. Because essentially I am a character actor, <laughs> I'm a leading man. But for, as far as High was concerned, I was a leading man, and that was it. And I don't know, one day in one of these episodes that you've printed out, somebody didn't show up, or there was an extra thing, and I got to play a garage mechanic. <laughs> and I think we were in England. I'm not sure. And I I just wanted, I, during the read-through, I did it with an Indian accent. Oh, that's and wonderful. And I went, he said, you know, I... <laughs> Uh, it was the be- but I don't. I think I was a character man for one out of uh, how many did I do? One hundred and thirty-eight. Uh, yeah, I do, one hundred and thirty-eight. I don't think I. My I think I played guy. one character. Well, we'll be back right after this. Everything old is new. I can continue talking all good things. Radio Mystery Theater. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. I was riding my motorcycle. George doesn't have a motorcycle. Where do you live, Mr. Marlin? I'm trying to live. Um, Spring Street, I think. Spring Street. Where? Right here. Right here in St. Louis. This is very hard to take. I'm sure it's temporary. He's a whole different personality. It's not just what he says, but the way he says it, he's he's just not George. Welcome to Everything Old Again. <laughs> this is Douglas Viviani, and we're having some fun sans David Cohen with Paul Hecht and Bob Caliban, who uh, were on many, many shows of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. That was a piece of uh, episode entitled A Second Chance. Both of these gentlemen acted together. I think, uh, Bob, you were the doctor there. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul was the gentleman, a bit of a quandary there on the uh, uh on the on the bed. Do you remember that? I mean, this is now. I'm going to go back. This is 1978, I think. Do you remember anything about that episode? I was uh, 22 at the time. <laughs> I, <didn't know. laughs> I can't remember any. You know, I've I've some odd mem. I mean, I mean, actors have very peculiar memories anyway. I have very strange memories, but I have no memory whatsoever of doing that. I don't even know what I was trying to do. Wait. <laughs> You're saying exactly what happens to me. Uh, I did Hamlet in college in 19... And I can still do uh, the soliloquies. To be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind. But I forgot what I had for breakfast (laughs) today, (laughs) you know. Well, that's because the Hamlet was important, but breakfast is not. Uh, It it seems to be uh, me. I don't know why, but uh, it it is funny what we remember and the parts we remember, uh, particularly uh, on on the CBS Mystery Theater. Um, Thank God Hyman remembered the kind of things that I could do. And uh, I was a this. It sounds egotistical. I don't mean it that way. I was a very busy voiceover actor on uh, commercials. And when I would get a call to say, okay, Tuesday, you're doing CBS Mystery Theater, I had to book out all of the commercials that I might have done for that day. And uh, at the time, I was saying, oh, gee, I don't know if I should give him a whole day. But when I look back on it, and the amount of times he called me and wanted me to be there and hopefully bring something, uh, it was just amazing. Did you do, do, when you say a whole day, because... He did one in the morning and one in the afternoon, yeah. but you did both. Once did in a while, he would I, have me yeah, for course, the whole day. Yeah, you're a character actor. Yeah. Leading men. No. You'd do one, one. and either you'd be there in the morning or in the afternoon. You've got it right. It. So what was the process? You would get a call how soon in advance of the re- recording date, let's call it? A couple of days mm-hmm. or weeks? A week sometimes. Did they Maybe send you the script? Mm-hmm. Would uh, they send you the script ahead of time? Or did you have, no. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so you would, let's, let's hear it. You would walk in. Walk in. That, are you saying they did two in one day? 
Bobby would do too. I wouldn't because I, I was a leading yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So they, they, they do uh, shows in pieces or they do one straight through? Do they record it in one day or do they record different pieces and piece it straight together? Through. Straight you, through. Straight oh, through. Straight through. There was no pieces. Yeah. Just and, and that's a, a marvelous <laughs> thing because you got the feeling of the whole pro, the, the, the whole idea and uh, it, it works so well for you because sometimes when you go in and do a um, a part on uh, on a soap opera or something, they may have you in on a Monday and then the Thursday you're going to complete that and then you go wait a minute I, I don't don't do that let's do the whole thing and High was very good at that. He so would, just for, just to get an idea, so this was like a play, if you will. When you did this, you started. E. G. Marshall began, I presume, no, and I never else. saw. Oh, him. so he was we somewhere else. He recorded him. this his. photograph that you have must have been staged because it did was. You ever see I him? never did saw him. him? Interesting. Uh, I mean, no. So he would do his bits. That's yeah. recorded ahead of time, Sep- and then the separate, rest completely separately, and then yep. he'd piece that together. Okay, and then would they play that before your no. your show started? No. no so you, you know, so oh, you never were, heard. Were you of... kidding? Wasting time. I know. Doing the, no. So then you never knew what he was saying uh, before to introduce this particular episode. I guess didn't matter. Yeah, you no. just did, you just Not dove right all. into it. So at that point, you would die, you would start from square one. Word one on Do the it. script and go straight through. through. Now, how did they have it timed? You were talking a little bit about this, but how did they have it timed out? If that's the case, for, let's call it 11 minutes. I don't know how many minutes each section was, but let's say 11 minutes. How did we know that we were ending on 11 minutes on the dot? It wasn't 11 minutes, but I don't know. that. You, you should have to ask high, and you can't. I don't think right. it ever mattered to us. They no. counted by page, probably he, he, estimated. Yes. And, and I mean, the only thing that high used to, another thing that high used to get upset about during the read through, particularly with me, because I was. I was a naughty boy. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. I, I like to have fun. I like to tease him. He really liked me, uh, uh, so I could sort of tease him by, by, by change. I would change things as I went along if I didn't like, quite like them. And because I was so worried about not going over, he'd sort of basically let me do whatever I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I forget my, my my train of thought. Uh, yeah, it all had to do. It all had to do with with with. Oh, yes, timing. Well, right. I was going to say, so, yeah, was time timing. was the whole thing. He had this old watch. <laughs> oh, he did. <laughs> from the old days of radio. Do you think this is the old yep. days of radio? Right. We're talking about the old, when he did Inner the Sanctum, old right? days of radio. Yes. Yeah. And I think that creaking door was from... Absolutely, Inner Sanctum, yeah. From Inner Sanctum, yes. wasn't it? It was not original for CBS Radio Mystery Theater. It was Theater. Inner Sanctum. Right. Inner yep. Sanctum, yeah. He, uh, God knows how he didn't want to spend any more money doing another <laughs> creaking door. If he already had one. <laughs> oh, right. he wouldn't oh. ever... The and they had a bit of music always. They, they maybe yeah. they had ten different clips, and that all, was it for the all, all episodes. They were all from old theaters, yep. right? And the joke I remember somebody said, "Oh, Radio Mystery Theater, it's great. You go in and I gives you the check. You get a check. You don't have to wait for the check." I said, "That's because he doesn't want to use a stamp, right? <laughs> he doesn't want to absolutely pay for it in the postage." There was no question about it. He wouldn't send you anything. He wouldn't call you because it may. No. It do too much do I have a, a number of yeah, calls I yeah. can make? And, right, you know, right, so right. you would go in, you would read the script once as a read through as a yeah. group, right? Yep, yep. And then you say you took a break Around for a few minutes. For just a few minutes, basically to pee, and if you were lucky to grab, I think there was a coffee, I can't remember. Was there? I can't remember. I don't drink coffee, so I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe water, yeah. I guess, right? Sounds yeah, like. That's about uh, it. <laughs> from the faucet. Yes. And, and you'd schmooze a bit, but not much. And then you do yeah. it, and then, and then that was it. it. You get your check and it. leave. Get your check, yep. and you say thank you, hi, and he wouldn't say, you know. Sometimes if I was in the afternoon one, I would walk. He would always walk home back up to Central oh, Park West. You know, oh. We'd walk for a bit, or I'd walk with whoever was walking. Yeah. I remember walking with Fred Gwynn. We used to walk up oh, Madison sure. Avenue. I loved Fred. Yeah. And Bobby Dryden, do you remember Bobby? Oh, sure, do I remember right, Bobby he Dryden? He is Bob. I'm sure you've le- I'm sure you've got you've Bob Dryden, one most of the all time great character yeah. people. I mean, Bobby Caliban was pretty good, but Bob Dryden, I don't know how he did it. He would change his yeah. voice completely. You can sometimes hear Bobby Dryden on on the Spaghetti Westerns. Oh yes. Have you ever have you have you, yeah, have you watched um, uh, the, the the Good, Bad, and the Ugly? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, there's Bobby going. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, How are you doing? One of those, dubbing one of those characters. And he actually, I think hmm. in my research, I think he did 320 of these episodes. He I was one of the ones. Is that right? Yeah, 304. 304. So I oh look at that. We've all done our research. That's good. Well, I mean, that's amazing. Figured. Russell did 236. Russell Horton, right? Yeah. Uh, Marion Seldes did 206. 
I did a mere 138, and you didn't even get to do 100. <laughs> well, now, although, yeah, I, uh, although we're not counting the ones that we used to do after CBS Radio Mystery Theater. There you go. There was a whole lot of strange ones that we used to do at CUNY. And, oh, yes. You know. Yeah. So it was something that you would do for the day. You'd get a call. You'd do for the day. Now, and I shouldn't say day. You're saying day, but because maybe you did two shows. But I if you were called for one, you, was it a three or four hour commitment, I guess? Yeah. And, yes, yeah, that that's was about it. And nine, and you'd be out by So that, yeah. to me, that lends uh, credibility to the idea that the gentlemen and ladies that were in this theater production were real talent, real... I mean, to be able to do that and create a character and present it in such a way that on the radio we were able to enjoy and know the different voices and, and the different characterizations and the inflection, I have to say, is, is a real talent. Well, as the, as the punchline of one of the, my favorite jokes goes, well, that's acting. That's acting. <laughs> right? True, uh, true enough. But you know, you this kind of acting is a special kind of acting, as I'm sure you're, you and your audience knows from listening to audiobooks. Some of the some of our best actors are no good. <laughs> at, Absolutely, at, at and certainly authors are very even reading very their, few. Yeah. Yeah. even reading their own autobiographies, if you will. Yeah. You see, <laughs> well, it's a special. It's a yeah. special knack. Yes. Well, you how know? did you learn it? I mean, a couple a couple seconds here. I don't know. I mean, I don't think you learn it. I think you just uh, give. Uh, it, it it has to do with the musical ability. What do you think? Bob? Well, I know how I learned. I listened to other yeah. actors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who was the the comic on Jack Benny? Uh, um, yeah. Oh come on, Bob. Never mind. But he did all these voices, and I listened to him, and I would I would listen to I uh, I would have my head literally. We had a big radio, uh, probably four feet tall. And I would get on my hands and knees, and I would stay so close to that radio because I didn't want to miss anything. That, that... was before headphones. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, was it ever? And I'm before trying to... cash machines, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. But uh, I listened to so many other people, and uh, I probably stole from them. And, uh, yeah, me if, too. If they knew it, yeah. you know. Well, I grew up in England, so I listened to the radio. I had a little... Do, do, do you know what a crystal set? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to leave it right there and uh, see if you could look up on the internet now what a crystal right set now, was. Look it and up. we'll be we'll back be right, right back. after this and continue <laughs> with Paul and Bob. And everything old is new again. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Something pulled me back. Oh? Back where? To... Finish something. Do you see that light out there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you finish it? Yes. Yeah, yes, I did. Oh, that's good. The light's getting closer. I still wonder where we are. Don't you wonder where we are? I know where we are. We're on Everything Old is New Again. That's where we That's are. That's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking all things That's CBS real, Radio, Radio Mystery Theater. That's Radio a continuation and the uh, end of A Second Chance, which was the episode we, we heard a smidge back uh, on uh, on our show, uh, the last clip. And we're with uh, uh, two gentlemen that have been on the Radio Industry Theater for quite some time, or were on for quite some time, and many times, and, and we enjoyed their work. They were there right there in, on that clip. Uh, Bob Caliban and Paul Hecht, welcome back, gentlemen. Oh, it's so wonderful to be back, I tell you. Now, that particular episode, I know you don't remember, I just for the audience, bottom line is two gentlemen die in totally different parts of the country, <laughs> and one of them comes back to life, he's on the table, but he's the essence of the one, other one that died and he has a mission and the mission is to stop a building from falling uh, and he has it and he doesn't know why or what have you and he knows that he has to stop he goes to the architects they change their mistake they save lives and then he dies and so the end of the episode is that the both souls are there in heaven and they kind of don't know what went on there uh, <laughs> but uh, in essence we do and it, it was very symbolic there were many episodes that had mes messages in them certainly there was some mysteries but there were other episodes that had these afterlife themes yes. and oh, messages, yes. and I think it's it, it's really worthwhile to to dig in and and just tune into some of these episodes. You'll be surprised at how engaging they are. And I I, I always think of myself when I, when I move into some place, uh, 
uh, or, or I get a new piece of furniture that I have to put together, uh, my, the first thing I do is grab the Radio Mystery Theater episodes because I know I'm going to be there for at least 45 <laughs> minutes putting these, if not three hours, putting, putting these together. couches together, whatever. Yeah. And it makes it fun because you can do other things, of course, while listening to the radio. And that's I just one of the things that I want to uh, thank you, I guess, for it's, uh, helping me putting together all those all those pieces of furniture. You've just said it. The <laughs> wonderful thing about radio is that you can do other things and still hear a show or hear a, a comic routine or whatever. And uh, it, it just can carry you for the whole day. Exactly. And now it's, it is, I don't want to say the number of years, but because we're all uh, moving on. But the idea is all those years ago, I have a number of episodes here that I'm just going to throw at you. If you even remember an inkling of the episode, these are ones that both of you worked together. So it's sort of oh. maybe that'll help a little bit. The Thomas I Jeff. Can, yes. I can tell you already the answer is no. Because <laughs> <laughs> let's remember now, you, you like you say, you did it for maybe three hours and that was it. And you didn't hear it again. You may have heard it. Maybe you yeah. heard it broadcast. Yeah. I don't and know. I've done a few things. Since, Since then, exactly. that have erased yeah. some of. There was no room on the tar on the. But I think you just mentioned. Can you it. remember? Uh, the even body? though, even though we m made the the uh, show, uh, CBS Mystery Theater, most of the time I never heard them when they were uh, broadcast, uh, and it's too bad because you think, gee whiz, uh, you're driving in the car, you could hear it, and I did a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was uh, in the car. I would I would hear it. And uh, just marvel at the people who did them. Not not necessarily me, but Paul and uh, so many wonderful people that I got to work with. And uh, I heard uh, one on the American Forces Network. I, I had a girlfriend in Germany, and I was fiddling around with my radio, not her. And uh, <laughs> and there was one of them. And there I was in Bremen, in some little funny place. And I went, <laughs> Yeah, God. Yeah, and in this day and age, you, you don't realize uh, you there are hear. websites now you can yeah. hear them all the time. That's right. And they're getting yeah. thousands and yeah. thousands and thousands of hits per episode times 1399 episodes. And Hyman would be rolling in his grave <laughs> you want if he knew the bar, right? people were listening like that for free. No, he is rolling. He's rolling in Believe his grave. Believe me, he's We're rolling. Going, ah, yeah, <laughs> how come I don't get some money? I don't get a get the neck of You know uh, what's going on out there? <laughs> and we're talking Hyman Brown, who was, uh, I guess we could say the creator, but certainly the producer of uh, every, an engineer, uh, let's say the producer, right? And director of, of oh, he was, he was, was, all he of those was, He was everything. Yeah. I mean, he didn't write them. He had this no, whole no. stable of old-time of old time guys writing words. I couldn't believe, even, even at those days, I said, hi, we can't say Simone. Simoleon. Nobody knows what a simoleon is anymore. Yeah. Do you know what a simoleon? I mean, you know. Oh, it's that, I mean, that Girl Scout cookie, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <There> is a... <laughs> it better be. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'm sorry to to uh, interrupt, but I don't know about you, Bobby, but I can't remember. I mean, I have one that I do remember. The one that I did, I got a crib sheet. I did with Mike Tolan, Michael Tolan. Very, oh. good, very good actor. Yes. And Mike Tolan, hi hired Mike and I to play twin brothers because we sounded like I said hi why don't we just what just either use Mike to use his high voice and his low voice or use me to yeah. use my high voice no 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 it's a, no no so Mike Toland and I who had similar voices but not the same that's the one I can remember that if my I don't know if Mike's still alive even I don't even know I don't know yeah Michael Toland was a very good looking terrific actor He's, he was in yeah, yeah. anyway well, I'll tell you, you know, you were had the opportunity to play all different kinds of parts. So you were Thomas Jefferson at one point. You were uh, George Washington at one point. You were, <laughs> if you remember some of these, uh, you were Charles, in a Charles Dickens episode where Charles, you were not Charles Dickens, but there was a character that yeah. was Charles Dickens solving prob crimes. And uh, so it, it be became very creative. Bob, I remember one, you were in a cave at some point, and water was filling up in the cave, and you were with a couple other people and trying to get out, and, and there was a serpent in there. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh, God, no, no so, wonder I didn't play those parts. I can't do that. You can't do that. No. It goes on and on, and, and the, the, then the lens of the question is, did it matter? Were there any uh, scripts that, you, that you kind of, besides, you know, the idea that you're, you're, you're in the craft and you're going to do your craft, did, you, did any of them come to mind and say, maybe you don't remember the exact script now, but and he said, hey, this is really a nice script, or hey, this is really a part that's interesting that I've been 
played before George Washington or whatever it might be? Or was it basically just let's do the job and move on? Did you have any editorial comments in your mind as you were getting these scripts? I guess it's a, a better question. I don't think any. I think no, the, I think the, the, the let's whole thing was. Let's just get this done and yeah. move on. Uh, uh, I'm working today. Yeah. Right. That's. I mean, that's part. What it was. That's part of the definition of being a professional. As far as I'm concerned, you show up on time. You get there on time, and you do it. And you do the job. Right. Yeah. You can be an amateur as well, which comes from the Latin "amare" to love, to love what you do. Yeah. But in fact, being a professional is show up on time. And do what you're asked to do. Yeah, and it is a talent. Though I mean, you've seen people, maybe I've seen people where they can play the piano and they've got to read the music and they're competent. Then there are others that can sit down to the piano, whether they're reading music or not, and and for the first time in their life see this particular song or work of whatever it might be and perform it beautifully yeah. with inflection and so forth. And I think that's what we're saying is is there's a huge difference there. And to me, you two gentlemen, uh, to me, emphasize. Produce a product that I could say, I guess, from the outside looking in, is is such quality that you have to be, of course, that professional, but tremendous talent to be able to look at a script, read through it once, and then perform what we're hearing on on the uh, on the air, and and for them to be able to, as you were saying before, select individuals like yourself and Fred Gwynn and so forth, all of these other actors. Um, uh, you know, Mandel Kramer and and uh, Man, and De Silva, and I mean, just so many people. That could do this. I would have thought that there was it was an all day process to hear that it was. Uh, uh, you know, it's well, like that's one of the great things about radio, is you don't have to look your best. You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't. There's no costume. There's no makeup. There's no nothing. You don't have to learn your lines, right? No. You hold your script, and you sight read. People say, "But don't you make me stay?" I said, "No, it's like music. I mean, do you play the piano?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, you." You, you know, yeah, you can maybe not play it exactly, but you're looking ahead. You know, your fingers are your fingers are playing what you saw a second, right? You read ahead. But over everybody in the performance was that way because you're saying yeah. you played it right through. We would hear if there were, because you're saying you didn't cut. So there really weren't anybody messed up words or mixed up uh, intonations or whatever it might don't be. Don't forget the other thing, Douglas, is we all know each other. We all knew each other well. And, and I would put seven people together I mean Bobby and I you know everybody knows instinctively if the other guy is sort of lost or can't find it or or you are helping him get to the next line that's what we do yeah. with each other right well, I, I go back to listening. If you listen to these old Abbott Costello shows, though, and they were professionals that did a beautiful job with what they did. But when they did, if you heard their radio, hear the radio show, you know that Costello's reading. You could hear him reading, and he's a prof He didn't have this talent. Even he didn't. He had other talents, yeah, but he didn't I have this talent that you gentlemen have. If that makes sense, I don't mean to pick on him, but the idea is you could hear. And he made fun of it sometimes. He'd drop a page, or he would he he would mix, mix up a word, and he would make. Fun. He knew he wasn't an actor the way you. Are. Well, don't yeah. forget, Douglas, there's another thing. If you look at the list of actors that are on the roster, if you go to the thing, there are some very good actors that have only done one show. Mm -hmm. And that's either because I didn't like, you know, because, or they, they just were available for one show. Are we running out of our segment time? Yes, we'll yeah. be right back. And we're going to continue. We've got to finish that Crystal Radio uh, story. Oh, we'll, right. We don't even. We'll be yeah. back right after this and everything else new again. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. The radio drama has been effectively dead for about 25 years because that was the entertainment center of the American family. Isn't that true? When I was told this incident, it uh, gave me goosebumps. An eight-year-old boy was asked why he listened to the radio in preference to television. And he says, because I can see the pictures more clearly. Hmm. Because the theater of the imagination, which you, which you just spoke of, is that uh, that's what radio did. It excited our imaginations. Now we see it all. And I think we're getting uh, uh, bored with it. Nothing uh, provokes our imagination anymore. Uh, what interests me about radio is that it's just the words. That you listen to the words and the, the writer and the, the actor and actress and the God, musician and the sound effects me, man. Gee help you make this picture in your mind and uh, it is a clearer picture 
because it's very individual. Welcome back to Everything Old is New again. We're talking all things radio and radio mystery theater with uh, our special guests, Bob Caliban and Paul Hecht, who are on CBS Radio Mystery Theater for uh, quite a number of episodes. Uh, welcome back, gentlemen. Oh, it's great to be back. Uh, David Cohen, my uh, partner in crime, is is uh, missing uh, quite an event here. Too bad he's under the weather, but we'll survive and oh, he'll that's survive. that's too bad. Yes, uh, he'll have to listen to this on the, uh, on the radio himself. But uh, that is a little bit of a clip of E.G. Marshall in 1974 when the series was just getting started on a show called Day and Night, which was uh, James uh, Day presented an interview with E.G. Marshall. He was wondering, why are you doing, he's saying to E.G. Marshall, who's a a cornerstone in the beginning of radio, he's on The Detective and a couple of uh, very well-known shows, and and E.G. Marshall was trying to present why he was going back to radio in the 70s when effectively it was dead for, uh, or a wasteland, as it was saying, for these radio dramas. And he didn't know where we were going to go with this, if it was going to be successful or not. Did you feel that when you first began this, that this was a, eh, it'll last for one year and we'll move on? Or did you have some feeling that you were onto something here and that it would find an audience? I knew that this was something that would go on because people love to listen to things, whether it's to listen to another person standing <laughs> next to you or listening to a, 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 an advertisement. Um, most of the time, you have to have something special to make people keep listening. And uh, I was just blown away with, uh, with the chance of, of doing as many characters as uh, Hyman <laughs> would allow me to do. But uh, I had to sometimes worry that um, I may not get another call from Hyman uh, simply because, well, you've done a lot of characters and now it's time for somebody else. But he realized that I was kind of uh, hopefully creating every time that I got that script. You, you'd walk in, uh, let's say it's a Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, and they hand you a script, and you go, oh, I- I'm playing f- f- four <laughs> characters, or I'm playing one, or whatever. I mean, Paul was uh, most of the time the, the star of the show, but uh, for me, just to have the opportunity to create something and sometimes it was to create many things on the same show uh that it was uh, sometimes just one line but if you didn't do that line correctly <laughs> hyman would uh, um all right let's do that again boys you know, let's do it six. but uh, maybe it was a doorman or a or a, a salesperson you know and we're talking about Hyman Brown. Let's just f- focus in on it for a sure. minute. People don't or aren't familiar. He's a gentleman that started out in radio, I believe, in the 30s, certainly in the 40s. Was the the mastermind, if you will, behind uh, Inner Sanctum. And if you listen to that, or you have your dad or granddad Grand, listen to Grand those, Grand Central, Grand, Grand Central? Central Station. Was yeah, I think another so. Another one, Grand Central yeah. Station. If you if you you yeah. can listen to all these old shows on old time radio websites and oh, so boy. forth, uh, you'll hear that creaking door. From as we talked about, from uh, that is distinctive to Radio Mystery Theater, but you'll hear that in a half hour anthology of uh, these kind of stories in the Inner Sanctum. Sure. And so he was behind that as well. So he was very well versed in the field uh, when he came to you. Did you know that already, Paul? Or no, I had no idea or even any thought really about this was going to go on and on and on. It was. A, um, I had done a play. The first thing I ever did when I came to New York, I did a play with Marion Selders at the old American Place Theater on 46th Street. And she must have remembered me from the fact that I was Canadian and I did a lot of radio in my early Canadian years um, because the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, had at that time a strong tradition in the English tradition of radio. And so she must have remembered that and introduced me to high and that was it. Um, But I had no idea or even thought that it was going to be more than just one job. I thought, oh, God, radio. I love radio. I mean, there is not an actor on the face of this earth that does not love or would not love to do radio, which brings me to 
the what I consider to be an unfortunate state of affairs, which is there doesn't seem to be any radio drama at the moment. No. And there's podcasts and stuff. I haven't found anything. Do you have you? I haven't. I've, I've been to uh, some Doctor Who conventions along with uh, some of what we do here. We sometimes visit some of these conventions in search of uh, the past and what's happening. That show's been on for 50 years. In England, they have... Uh, still have radio dramas yeah. and Doctor Who radio dramas even on podcasts and all yeah. but not other than I audio know. books I don't hear any dramas I don't understand dramas. it because now with podcasts it's right. a natural place I had hoped that after High died I, and uh, that, that because he left a considerable amount of money for the foundation that we could get it going again and to cut a long story short, it didn't happen. You know, we, we tried one ourselves on Everything Old is New Again. You look at our website at everythingoldisnewagain.biz, everythingoldisnewagain.biz. You'll see a radio show that we did. Uh, we created our, our own, uh, in the ilk of Radio Mystery Theater, our own play. Oh, and it went over okay, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it really was great fun, but you have to have the right people <laughs> doing the performance. And, of course, we're amateurs, so we did the best we could. But it gave us a real good uh, understanding of what the talent is and, and to portray uh, you know, the characters. We had one person that really was very good. It portrayed a, a very good character and was memorable. Others, I'm not going to say, but you, you, know, you could tell that they were reading a line, if that makes yeah. sense. Uh, and so it's not, it's not well, easy. Well, that's I didn't get a call, <laughs> did you, Paul? <laughs> no. Well, now that we've no. been introduced, you may get the call. <laughs> what did Hyman pay? 123 I could do that. <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> Actually, Forget I inflation. I think it was less to start with. I was just going to say, I don't think up. I was at the top I just of the made list. That, I just <laughs> made up that number. I don't know if it... I don't know. Yeah. We'll pay for gas, too. We'll put yeah. it that way. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so we'll see what happens, but uh, it, it, it is a... And we'll talk about this on our next show, because we're running out of time. The state of radio, the state of the radio the way it was then, certainly in the 50s and the 40s, it was the entertainment forum. It was the internet. It was everything everything 50s and 60s it changed because of television it became more popular of course and then in the 70s i think was just sort of the last spurt of creativity and i'm saying that radio's not creative now but you see a lot of the same things i don't see any as we're saying any drama and i don't see bob and ray comedies i don't see mm, yeah. you know, gene shepherd uh, it's, doing it's, his it's odd because the the because the the delivery system is there I mean, if, if anything, the delivery system is now infinite. Yep. It should be, what we're saying is it should be easier, it should, it's more accessible, yeah, yeah, it certainly is. podcasts and so forth for people to, to get involved with no this. No question. And, and it seems to be, this is, this is where, how we talk about and sell our show, and I think it's growing in that uh, we're trying to make radio fun again. I think that you hear a lot of uh, sports talk, you hear a lot of politics talk, you hear a lot of medicine, and um, I don't, you tell me, and news, and music, and that's about radio. That's right now. So yeah. it's, a, it's so much more we could do. Well, it'll take it'll take some eccentric person <laughs> right. to get it going again. I thought I was going to be that eccentric person, and I was actually quite excited by the prospect of what I was going to do. With, through the High Brown Foundation. Sure. And as I say, to cut a long story short, it didn't quite work. Yeah. And that's a shame because um, it's a medium that's so personal, that's so memorable, and so important. It's not going away. Um, I think, the, you know, this business of, of the everybody on these, the phones every two seconds, clicking, oh, clicking. Are they ever? Is a little bit. I think we're going to back off that a little bit. I think we'll see. Soon, I think everything has this flush of I have to do it and I love it. I'm not saying it's going to go away, but I am saying that there will be a time, and I think we've seen podcasts and radio uh, where people are saying, even radio shows that are, are now on a podcast, if you've missed the show, you can listen to a show. Uh, I think people are starting to say, you know what, I can have control over the radio as I have it over the television now, and I can binge a show or I can find yeah. a show that I like. Well, what I mean, what I'm trying to say is that the delivery system is there. You know, I mean, it is it is odd to get on the subway and see everybody oh my looking gosh. at their phones. Right. But in fact, it's only the different delivery system because in the old days, everybody was behind the New York Times or whatever yeah. paper, right? So they were reading. It's they're still yeah. reading or listening. Exactly, they you are know? listening. Most of them are listening Most to something. Of them are listening or something. They, and 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 Broadway is doing very well. So people are also, you know, sure. 
Yeah, people's it, it, desire for entertainment hasn't changed. No. It's and, just, as yeah. you say, the delivery of the entertainment and where are we going with this it. This uh, is whoops, everything kind of old is new again. That's, that's a mistake. We'll go. <laughs> anyway, we are at, at the end. We'll be back right after this uh, week-long break, and we'll come back next week. Uh, talk more Radio Mystery Theater and the state of radio. And everything old is new again. Uh, Paul and Bob, thank you very much for your time. We'll have you back. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Everything Old is New Again is sponsored by the Law Office of Douglas Viviani. Douglas Viviani has been providing quality legal service for over 26 years. We're a general practice firm and can handle any legal matter you may have for a reasonable fee. If you're involved in a car accident, starting a business, planning your estate, or need a criminal attorney, please call 631-681-1910 or email us at vivianilaw at aol.com for a free consultation. Get the justice you deserve. Contact the Law Office of Douglas Viviani at vivianilaw at aol.com. You've been listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's pop culture entertainment talk show. Find us on the web at everythingoldisnewagain.biz. That's dot biz. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station.